Is Christianity simply about salvation? Does it provide answers for the here and now? Is it only a hope for an eternal future? Well, our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, addresses these questions and more today on Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, inviting you to hop aboard the Bible bus as we travel further into Romans 12. So find your seat, get your Bible, and as you do that, Greg and I have a quick update on the good things that God has planned for us to do as a TTB family. Steve, earlier this month, I shared with our family that I wish they could all come into my office. I don't think there's room. It's a pretty, pretty small yes. office, but I, you know, metaphorically, I would love if you could come and just stand behind my chair and I could say, look, look at these emails that are coming in and these, these pieces of news from all over the world about what God does when we let him do the planning. Mm-hmm. And I love that you said what God has planned. Yeah. Uh, we were talking with our great chairman emeritus, Leo Carlin, who we love, who's 91 years young and going strong. This morning, we were talking to him and saying, you know, we tell our listening family, we don't have the master plan. God does. Yeah. And I really like the way you have kind of instilled that in the organization and in the thought of the board in that we don't have a master plan. We're going to wait and see and see how God faithfully moves in the ministry. And he has, it seems like it's just accelerating. It's like, hold on, Lord, just give us a little bit of time. (laughs) But we have new opportunities coming to us all the time. God is spreading the word and using through the Bible and what I think is some really significant ways all around the world. Yes. And let me give you a couple of examples of that. Some that you, I could easily pull up some emails from my uh, inbox and show you. But just before we went into the studio, I was thinking about we're, we're a couple of days away from a major milestone in the history of our ministry. And that is, that as we go into uh, 2023, just a couple days from now, we will no longer be airing radio programs to India. But but wait, we're doing a lot in India and we're getting huge response. We have moved into audiovisual, into television, and we moved into YouTube. Uh, and let me just give you some statistics. I, I just looked up today the, uh, the Telugu television channel on YouTube has 42,000 followers hmm. on YouTube. We have 5.7 million views. Yeah. And this is only a few years old, Steve. Yeah. We just made this change within the last two years. Yeah, it's significant. Um, the Malayalam has 20,000 followers and 3 million views. Uh, the Hindi channel has 29,000 followers and 2.8 million views. And the Tamil uh, TTB channel has 60,000 followers and 6.7 million views views. And so it's very important that everybody hears that say, well, why would you go off radio? Because in that country, and we've worked with the leaders, it wasn't some decision we made in isolation. Uh, But this is a reflection of our following God where he leads. And when he leads, we just see the ministry prosper. Yeah. And we're not saying that radio is no longer going to be a part of through the Bible. I think it's going to be there in different parts of the world for a long time to come. Africa is one one part of the world where it makes sense. Absolutely. But in India, I mean, it's a fairly technologically advanced country. There's a high penetration of smartphones Mm -hmm. and people are no longer turning on the radio like they used yeah. to. And the the fact that we've got programs and offerings that are able to be used on a smartphone and people are responding and we can track, we can see the fruit so much better. Mm-hmm. Dr. McGee talks about flinging out the seed and yeah, I don't right. know where it goes because I can't see you raise your hand and see that you've gotten it. Well, with technology, we, we have the ability yes, to see that. We actually can. That's a Here's a great illustration. Earlier this week, I was talking to one of the guys on our technology team who, uh, his name is Dan, and I say he, he produces Danalytics is what I yeah. call it, <laughs> because he loves the analytics. And, that's, and he said, we were talking about these different apps that we've been building, and he said, there's a, a guy, one guy in Australia that I wish I could call him up and because he's listening like binging every yeah. day listening he must have to it like playing book. on a shop uh it, it, you know it, it, exactly. every day all day like some people have you know muzak in the yes. background he's yeah. got through the he's bible got through going. the bible playing through his app and so what we want everybody to know that god is leading us into new ways of delivering the content it's dr mcgee's teaching 
the lives that are being changed. It's the same kind of life change. It's just a different way to yeah. get the message. Yeah. And you bring up a good point about that Australian guy. You know, we're seeing as all these different languages get rolled out and the language contextualized apps, mm-hmm. if you don't know what that means, don't worry about yeah. it. It just means you're getting it into different parts of the world. We're seeing the diaspora, the, the dispersed yes. people from those yeah. countries. And it's like, oh, look, here it is in, you know, Saudi Arabia. And we're seeing, you know, Indonesian languages coming yes. in. We're seeing yeah. Indian languages because those are the workers that are being brought in there. And there's listening groups that are being formed in a country that it's very dangerous to be a Christian. And yet God yes. is using smartphone technology and through the Bible to minister to people in that country. And so that's what's new. That's what's happening as we head into 2023. We're excited to see God grow the ministry. And like you said, we're talking about in the, the Indian the numbers that I named are mm-hmm. probably from all over the world, not yeah. just India. Yeah, so encouraging. Greg, let me pray for us as we begin our study. Heavenly Father, we just we just marvel at your faithfulness and the way you move through your Holy Spirit, through this ministry, and through other ministries around the world. Our desire, Lord, is that you would be glorified by many people coming to you and that those that know you have saving faith in Christ, that they would grow in their faith. I pray that you would continue to bless the ministry through the Bible and the program as it goes out today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we are looking here in chapter 12 at the relationships that a believer has to those about him, and this has to do with Christian service. We're seeing now the relationship of one believer to other believers, and we have seen here that love is the motivating force. It should not be with hypocrisy, however, but that doesn't mean that you're to be lovey-dovey and a compromiser, but you're to express your hatred of that which is evil, and you're to stick like adhesive tape to that which is good. You can just be held to that which is good as if you're there with Elmer's glue, my friend. Then, as to your brotherly love, have family affection. Now, two believers are closer together than two blood brothers if one of them is saved and the other's not. Here are three men sitting here. Two of them are identical twins. One's a Christian, the other's not. Sitting next to the believer is a man from Africa. His color of his skin is different. His whole culture, background is different, but he's a believer. Now, may I say that the twin that's a Christian and this black brother, they are closer together than the two, than the twins are. I started to say two twins, but what other kind of twins are? There were two. And so they are closer together than that. And that's the reason that we should recognize we're in the same family. Now, you ought to be nicer to me than you are because you're going to live with me through eternity. And you better start trying to get along with me and putting up with my peculiar ways. But wait just a minute. I'll have a new body then. I'll get rid of the old nature, and you will too. <laughs> it's going to make it better for both of us. Now, will you notice, verse 12 says, rejoicing in hope. That is wonderful. The circumstances of the believer may not warrant rejoicing. The contrary may be true. But he sees the future, and in hope he projects himself into other circumstances which are more favorable. I think of the brother down in my Southland years ago that in a church service they were giving their favorite scripture. And he got up and said, His favorite was, it came to pass, and everybody looked puzzled. The preacher stood up and he said, Brother, how in the world can it came to pass be your favorite? Well, he said, when I read in the Bible it came to pass, I know that when I have trouble or I have problems that they came to pass, they didn't come to stay, and that there'll be a new day out there. May I say to you, that may not be the exact interpretation, but he sure is accurate. In what Paul is saying here, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation and trouble. That's difficult to be, isn't it? Continuing instant in prayer. Be a man of prayer. And then he says, distributing to the necessity of saints. That's something that means sharing the necessities of the saints. We today in conservative circles don't do that very much. A great many churches make a great deal of having a deacon's fund or a fund for the poor, but they don't use it very much. 
and then pursuing hospitality. That is something that is needy, that is given to hospitality. He's to seek out other believers to whom they can extend hospitality. There may be some person in your group, whether it be a church or a group or neighborhood, who's a Christian. That's backward. That is an introvert, retiring. But they long for Christian fellowship. Now, if you're an extrovert, look them up, find them out, and then bless them who persecute you. Now, that seems a needless injunction to believers, for one believer ought not to persecute another. But experience tells us that they do that sort of thing. And it's difficult to bless the man who's kicking you, you see. Now, verses 15 and 16, rejoice with them that do rejoice. Now, the world's motto is, laugh and the world laughs with you, but weep and you weep alone, for the sad old earth must, well, what, borrow its mirth, but has trouble enough of its own. Well, that's not true of the child of God. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. That doesn't mean identical, but we're to have the mind of Christ, and believers ought to enter emotionally into the lives of other believers. I think that this is something that makes genuine Christians so wonderful. I know that since I've had cancer, I even had one dear lady up in Oakland, California, that said, I'd be willing to take your place, take the cancer, that you might live. And I'm a nurse, and I'll just come down and nurse you. Well, I wasn't that bad. But the point is, that moved me more than anything that's ever happened. I didn't realize, very candidly, because Christians that I was moving among, a lot of them weren't quite to that place. But I found out there are many folk that enter into your life. How wonderful it is. And that's as it should be. Now we're told here, not only be of the same mind one with another, but not minding high things, but associating with humble men and things of low estate. Stop being wise in your own opinion. By the way, what an injunction that is. Don't mind high things. You know, a great many of the saints think they're way up there spiritually, and they're not. And then he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And what kind of mind is that? Humble. And then he says, stop being wise in your own eyes. I think the constant temptation of the Christian is to feel that he's smarter than he really is spiritually. Solomon, who was a man given wisdom of God, he has a very interesting injunction. I'll just read it and then go to the next subject. Proverbs 26, 12 says, Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There is more hope of a fool than of him. I didn't say it. Solomon said that. Now, we come in verses 17 through 21, the relationship to unbelievers. Now, we live in a world of unbelievers. What is to be our relationship? Recompense to no man evil for evil. That's something a believer needs to be very careful about in his relationship to the world outside. Provide things honest in the sight of all men, and there's nothing that has hurt the cause of Christ more than a dishonest Christian out there in the world. The world, you see, is not interested in whether you are a premillennialist or whether you believe in election or free will. In fact, the world's not even concerned about that. But they do want to know whether you pay your honest debts, whether you're truthful or not. They're very much interested in that. Are you a person that can be depended on? Would you make a good friend of an unbeliever? Could he depend on you? And I say that this is better than giving out tracts. Don't misunderstand me. We should give out tracts. We sure better have a life that'll back it up if you're going to start giving out tracts. Now he says, recompense to no man evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men. And I love this, if it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. And my friends, I like that because there's some people you just can't get along with them. 
They won't let you get along with them, but as much as possible. A dear lady who lived alone, a very wonderful Christian, called me one day and said she had a neighbor she couldn't get along with. Well, I thought maybe this lady here was living alone might be a little difficult, but she's a wonderful Christian. I knew that. And she wanted to know if I'd come out and talk to the neighbor, and I came out and talked to the neighbor. And I want to tell you, that neighbor told me what she thought of me also, as well as her neighbor. And so I just went back next door, told this wonderful Christian, I said, I think you don't need to worry about her anymore. You can't get along with her. Nobody can get along with that woman. I said, just forget it. I said, but just as much as within you. He didn't say you had to get along with him, but just do the best you can. This is an area, by the way, which is quite wonderful. Now, a lot of folk you can't get along with. Now, verses 19 and 20. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath, for it's written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him to drink, for in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire in his head. Now, this is probably one of the greatest principles that you'll find in the Word of God. And this is the most difficult thing for a child of God. When somebody hits you on one cheek, it's difficult to turn the other cheek. Or like the Irishman, he was hit on one cheek and he got up and he turned the other cheek and the fellow hit him, knocked him down. Then he got up and he just beat this stuffing out of the other fellow. And somebody said, why in the world did you do that? You turned the cheek. Why didn't you leave it like that? Well, he said, I'll tell you why. The Bible says, turn your cheek. And I had only one other cheek to turn. The Lord didn't tell me what to do after that, so I did what I thought I ought to do. Well, that's what most of us do. We do what we think we ought to do. Well, friends, actually, you and I find it difficult today not to hit back. But the minute that you and I take the matter in our own hands and attempt to work the thing out, and especially when we've been done wrong, to come back and hit as hard as we can, we take that matter out of the hands of God, and we're no longer walking by faith. What he's saying here is, you walk by faith with me, and let me handle the matter for you, because I'll handle it fair. I'll handle it in a just manner. And if this party needs to be taken care of, I'll take care of them. The Lord will do that. And God says, you trust me. And you and I can turn this over to the Lord and say, Lord, and I think we ought to do it. Lord, this part has injured me, has done me wrong, has said something about, lied about me, has been dishonest in money matters and in other ways. Now, I'm turning them over to you. You said you didn't want me to handle it. You handle it. And I think we ought to do that. Now, I find that the most difficult thing in the world to do. But there have been one or two times when I've turned it over to the Lord. And I'm amazed how well he handles it. He does it lots better than I do. I had a man that did me injury. He was an officer in the church. And he did me an awful injury, terrible injury. And my first thought was to clobber him. But I thought of this passage, and I went to the Lord, and I said, Lord, I'd like to hit him. I'd like to do something about this. And I could. But I said, I don't think I will. I'll turn it over to you, and I expect you to handle it. I saw that man the other day. I've never looked at a person as unhappy as that man is. He's had trouble, friend. I mean he's had trouble. The Lord has taken that fellow to the woodshed, and he's whipped him in an inch of his life. And you look in that man's face today, and you can't help but feel sorry for him because the Lord will handle a case for you. I know that. And I wish I could say to you, I turn all of them over to the Lord. Sometimes I hit back, friend. Now, verse 21, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. In other words, he's saying, stop being overcome of evil. Overcome evil by means of good. The believer walks through this evil world with its satanic system. He cannot fight it. If you start fighting this satanic system, my friend, it'll whip you. Nor you can't adopt the same worldly tactics of hate and revenge. If you do, it means sure defeat. Now, God has given the believer the good, the Holy Spirit. He's to walk in the Spirit. This I say, then, walk in the Spirit, 
he shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And if we live in the Spirit, Paul says, let us also walk in the Spirit. Now I come to chapter 13, and we still are talking about the service of the sons of God. And we now are going to see that the believer has citizenship in heaven, but he also is in a world where he's a citizen down here. And we have a twofold responsibility. If there's a conflict, always our responsibility is to our Lord in heaven. But we are told, the Lord Jesus made it very clear. Remember, they brought to him a coin one day. And in fact, he asked for that coin. You know the reason he asked for a coin? Two reasons. He wanted to use what they had. And I don't think he had one in his pocket that day. He didn't have very much when he's down here in this world. Now, he said to them when he took that coin, whose image is here? They said, it's Caesar's. He said, render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God. Now, governments are ordained of God. He gave them certain authority. At the very beginning, God says, whosoever sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he him. God has given to governments the power to take human life when an individual takes another human life. Now, that is his regard for human life. Human life is precious in God's sight. You have no right to take another human life. If you do, you're to forfeit your own. Now, I know that I sound like a barbarian to a great many of these soft-hearted and soft-headed judges and lawyers today that are trying to get rid of capital punishment. And as we proceed to get rid of capital punishment, crimes are multiplying today. And the criminal is the hero, and the honest man today is the villain. Isaiah said days had come like that. They'll call evil good, and they'll call good evil. We live in days like that. You and I, though, have a responsibility to government. And therefore, we are told, in fact, Paul told a young preacher, he says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, that's 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 3. I'd like to add this word, friends, that this doesn't mean that on Sunday morning the preacher's to pray that prayer. That can become pretty monotonous Sunday after Sunday. I think that you are to pray that prayer yourself, not leave it to the preacher. Now, the duty of the believer as a citizen of heaven is spiritual, and the duty of a believer as a citizen under a government down here, it's secular. We need to keep those separate. These are two separate functions, and to combine them is to fail to keep church and state separate and distinct. Now, the Jew in Paul's day was reluctant to bow before the proud Roman state. Jewry had fomented disturbances in the city of Rome, and as a result, Claudius had banished them on one occasion. Now, the proud Pharisees rejected the Roman authorities in Palestine in their desire to restore the government to the nation Israel. It was they who masterminded the encounter with Jesus which raised the issue, is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Now the implications smack of a revolution, as you can see. It's well to remember that the authorities in Paul's day were mad and murderous, and there was Nero on the throne, there was Herod and Pilate, all that bunch of rascals. And yet, he said, we are to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar. Now listen to Paul. And he says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there's no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Now you and I are to obey the laws of the land. A Christian should be a law-abiding citizen. Now, you can't make me believe that you can carry on the violence and lawlessness of this present hour and still be a Jesus boy or girl. You are a Jesus freak if you take that position, and I mean a freak, my friend. 
because we are to be law-abiding folk, even when we think the law is unjust. But I've got a great deal to say about this, but I'm going to have to say it next time. Until then, may God richly bless you. Join us next time as Dr. McGee has much more to teach us about Christians and their relationship to government and society. If you need to reach us, visit us at ttb.org or call 1-800-65-BIBLE. We'd love to connect with you. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be here saving a seat on the Bible bus just for you next time. Through the Bible is a five-year study of God's entire Word, and together we discover God's purposes in history and our lives, found only when we believe in Jesus Christ. Do you know Him yet?